Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm Ernie Bauer, the chair, Smitro Chair for Southeast Asia and Studies here, and uh, welcome to the Banyan Tree uh, Leadership Forum. Um, we have a very special guest uh, as our, our speaker today, uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Vietnam, uh, Pham Minh Minh. Um, is going to address us today, and we're very lucky to have uh, Scott Marcel uh, uh, to um, uh, introduce him. Before we start, uh, let me uh, do some administrative uh, guidance. We, uh, we invite everyone to tweet um, uh, using the hashtag, uh, hashtag CSIS Live, and uh, this event will be live tweeted by CSIS staff. We're happy to announce the, the launch uh, of our recent report, uh, A New Era in U.S.-Vietnam Relations, um, authored by uh, Murray Hebert, Fong Nguyen, and Greg Poling. And after the minister speaks and takes some questions, we will have a panel um, that will talk about the findings of that report and give you some insights into the political, economic, uh, and security uh, situation between our two countries. So. Um, please stay seated after the minister speaks. I will walk him out and then we'll reconvene the panel uh, after his remarks. Let me now introduce um, Scott Marcel. He is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, in charge of Southeast Asia. Scott's got a great Vietnam story. Um, for those of you who've known him uh, as long as I have, uh, he, uh, he actually was uh, our one of the first Americans, official Americans, to be uh, uh, stationed in Hanoi. And as we come up to 20 years of, uh, of, of the relationship, celebrate 20 years of, of, ta of our normalization, I think we can really look to Scott because he was, uh, he was stationed, I think, in the um, uh, Missing in Action POW office in Hanoi. Uh, he laid the groundwork for the early, uh, early US representation. Um, and then, of course, he went on to a, a, a great career in the State Department that he's in the middle of. Uh, he was ambassador, our first U.S. ambassador to ASEAN, and he was also um, most recently, before he came back to Washington for his current position, he was uh, the U.S. ambassador to Indonesia. So please join me in welcoming Scott Marcel. Scott. Thanks very much, Ernie, very kind of you. Um, although it does make me feel a little bit old uh, to think back, it was uh, just over 20 years ago that I, I got to Hanoi, and uh, it's really an honor for me to be here, particularly to introduce the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister. Um, it, it's remarkable looking back over the last 20 years how much we all together have accomplished in, in building a relationship, uh, particularly after the unique and not always wonderful history between our two countries that we've made a lot of progress and it's because of the work of a lot of people who've been really dedicated and focused on what's, what's gonna benefit the people of the United States and what's gonna benefit the people of Vietnam. And I think that's been the hallmark of of the building of this relationship. And uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister uh, Phan Bing Ming has certainly been one of the key players in this as well as in Vietnam's broader diplomatic efforts. And if you look at Vietnam now, how active it is in the region, on the world stage, it's, it's really a great story. And I, I think we look at Vietnam as, as a very constructive player in the region, a good partner in many areas, and, and a, a growing player is certainly in ASEAN and East Asia Summit, and increasingly um, globally. So uh, just a few words about the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, he uh, is, is a career diplomat uh, who became Deputy Prime Minister in November 2013 after becoming Minister of Foreign Affairs in August 2011. Uh, a long series of very important jobs uh, in the foreign ministry and abroad. He was uh, at a, s a couple of assignments in the United States once as the Deputy Permanent Representative to the UN uh, in New York and once as the Deputy Chief of Mission uh, in Washington at the Vietnamese Embassy. Um, he was one of the first Fulbright scholars from Vietnam uh, to come to the United States and he went to 
I have to say, the premier school, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, um, uh, and, and graduated from there with a master's degree in, in 1994. Um, he graduated from that school 11 years after me, but moved rapidly past me in the career progression. Uh, <laughs> which just gives you a sense of how, how smart and capable he is. And, and the last thing I would say is, is uh, a lot of our secretaries of state and other leaders have had the privilege of working with the deputy prime minister, foreign minister in recent years and, and have always found him to be um, extremely thoughtful and always very focused on how we can build closer relationship and closer cooperation. So it's really a great honor for me to introduce deputy prime minister and foreign minister Fan Bingming. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Scott Masson, for the uh, kind introduction. I think that you shoot me to the sky, to the moon now. <laughs> I'm so glad to uh, be back to the CSIS. Uh, I uh, came here also last year with the uh, presidents of Vietnam to, uh, uh, he, will, uh, he uh, gave a speech at this CSIS. And um, also, I believe that this institu institution is a world-class think, think tank, renowned not only in the United States, but all over the world. Many ideas from CSIS reports and roundtable discussions are inputs for policy makers. It's also a nice surprise to know that some Vietnamese scholars are working among you here. And this testifies to the vibrant growth of the all route relations between Vietnam and the United States, which have expanded to all fields, including the research on social sciences. There is now a lot of potentials for the two countries to work together for the benefits of the peoples of the two countries and for peace, prosperity, and development in Asia and the Pacific. That is why more than one year ago, President Chiang Tung Sang and Obama and President Obama announced the establishment of our comprehensive partnership to provide an overarching framework for bilateral cooperation in all areas to capture those potentials. We are, however, even eager to learn more ideas about how to promote even further the US-Vietnam relations. In that spirit, I welcome the launch of the report titled, A New Era in Vietnam, U.S. Relations, Deepening Ties After Two Decades of Normalizations by Murray Hinber, Grigory Poling, and Phu Nguyen. Thanks, Murray, for your efforts and leadership in this project, and also the recommendations in the report. I, hi I highly value the quality of the report, as well as some constructive policy recommendation retained in the uh, report. And the report quoted Secretary of State John Kerry as saying that no two countries have worked harder, done more, and done better to try to bring, bring themselves together and change history and change the future than Vietnam and the United States relation. I can agree more. The dramatic progress of the Vietnam-US relations in the past 19 years is simply unimaginable even for the strongest supporters of the normalizations of relations such as, such as the then Senator John Kerry. As we look forward to the 20th anniversary of the normalizations of relations between Vietnam and the United States, both countries can take pride of ourselves on the journey we have, we have made as well as we changed, we surpassed. We, uh, as well as challenges, we surpassed. Within just 20 years, our bilateral trade volume has increased 130 times 
reaching 30 billion US dollars in 2013, we are negotiating the ambitious 21st century Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. People-to-people -people contacts between the two countries have exploded. Exchanges of visits are enhanced. Vietnam now ranks first among ASEAN countries in terms of the number of students stay studying in the United States, totally over 16,000 Vietnamese students. We are having dialogues in various areas, such as political security, defense, labor, and even human rights. Through these dialogues, we exchange all the issues, including the differences in direct, frank, and constructive manner. Cooperations in other areas have also been promoted to a higher level. Civil nuclear cooperation is one of the examples. We are happy to see the one, two, three agreement between Vietnam and the United States was approved by the US Congress and taken to effect last month. This will open great opportunities for both countries to work together in this important area. Our relations have been expanded beyond our bilateral framework to many multilateral issues such as sustainable development under the Low Mekong Initiative framework, climate change, search and rescue, humanitarian assistance, and even UN peacekeeping operations. While moving forward, we are still working hard to, we are working hard on the war legacy issues such as Agent Orange, Unexploded Ordinance, MIA, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, to further deepen the comprehensive partnership, I particularly pay attention to the recommendations of the report. Many of the recommendations are quite constructive, and I believe that's some time over long, long overdue. Looking towards the 20th anniversary of our diplomatic relations, both countries should redouble our efforts, but also to work to deepen our bilateral relations and work within the ASEAN framework and with other partners to maintain peace, stability, and prosperity in our region and beyond. Our two countries should also work harder together and with other members' countries to conclude the TPP. As ASEAN builds the communi community by 2015, Vietnam will spare no efforts to deepen partnership between ASEAN and the United States. Peace, prosperity, and security in the Asia Pacific requires a strong Vietnam, a united ASEAN, and vibrant engagement of all major stakeholders in the world, especially the United States. We cannot change history, but we can change the future by working together with your strategic vision and the special importance you attach to Vietnam-US relations. All of you here at the CSIS can help shape the future of our comprehensive partnership between our two countries. And with that, you will help shape the future of the Asia and Pacific. It's my wish that the CSIS will do more, work harder with Vietnamese counterparts to make even greater contributions to deepening the ties between Vietnam and the United States for the sake of the mutual interest of both peoples as well as that of peace stability and prosperity in the Asia and Pacific. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, the minister has agreed to uh, take uh, a couple of questions, and uh, so we, we'd like to uh, open the audience uh, for that opportunity. The gentleman back here. 
Xiao Yang Xia from uh, Wen Hui Lei, Shanghai, China. Uh, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, uh, you, you mentioned that the Vietnam is to double your effort to strengthen the Vietnam-U.S. Uh, relation. Uh, the question is, how would uh, Vietnam handle its relation with China in the future in view of their bilateral dispute over maritime uh, issues? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. Now that we had the foreign policies of diversifications, multilateralizations, meaning that we develop relations with all countries, we have set up, we have established the relations with all major countries. With China, we have the strategic partnership. With the United States, we have the comprehensive partnership. We develop relations with one country. It does not hamper any relations with our, our countries with other countries. So it is uh, our policy. It's not depend on, it does not depend on one country when we develop relations with other countries. Gentleman here in the front. Uh, could you wait for the microphone? Uh, thank you. It's the question about relations with other countries. Uh, Tell us news agency, Russia. Uh, sir, can you tell me, can you tell uh, some updates about the situation uh, with Kamran Navy base? Kamran, uh, don't you know about Russian efforts uh, to go back there? And don't you know if some other countries express their interest about this base? Thank you. No Kamran Bay. And we developed Canberra Bay as a port, a civilian port, a civilian port. And we welcome all the uh, support and assistance for the development of that Canberra port. And th that is not a military port. And we do not, uh, you know, give that uh, Canberra port to, to any uh, countries. So that is our policy. Uh, Mr. Minister, I. I'd like to ask a question um, using the prerogative of the moderator. Uh, and in this town, there's been a lot of discussion recently about um, uh, lifting the embargo uh, on military sales to, to Vietnam and moving the mill-to-mill um, -mill relationship forward as, a, as part of normalization, full normalization uh, during our 20th anniversary year. How would Vietnam uh, look at these issues? Uh, and are you planning on having discussions about this with your counterparts here in the United States? Yes, uh, I have one occasion to uh, talk about these issues when I was in New York to, uh, in the uh, uh, Forum of Asia Society. I, I also have that question. I can say that we welcome all the decisions to make our relations more normal because we believe that we have normalized the relations already. We had the normalizations of the two countries since 1995. And believe me, at that time, people could not imagine how fast our relations developed. Today, nearly 20 years, we have established the comprehensive partnership. I like the, wor I like the word of Einstein. I quote, imagination is much more important than knowledge. So I believe that we can have more imaginations in the future. A uh, uh, lady in the back, in the in the back here, James. James. Uh. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Pri uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Um, recently, there have been. Could you calls just identify yourself? Oh, sorry, Lynn Kwok, um, Brookings Institution. Recently, there have been calls for China to declare an EEZ of 200 nautical miles over the largest features, the largest land features in the South China Sea and the Spratly Islands. Um, this would help with identifying 
the undisputed areas which um, the Southeast Asian claimants can go proceed to um, develop and identify the disputed areas which China together with the Southeast Asian claimants can jointly develop. Would Vietnam on its part be amenable to such a uh, move? Sure. Recently, there have been calls for China to declare a 200 nautical mile EEZ over the largest land features in the South China Sea. Um, this would allow the Southeast Asian claimants to proceed with development of the, the undisputed areas. So Vietnam can go ahead and uh, develop its, its, um, its uh, the, the areas clearly marked out as its own EEZ and then uh, get China and the rest of the Southeast Asian claimants to jointly develop the disputed areas which have been identified as a result of China declaring an e a clear EEZ rather than a nine dash line over the almost the whole South China Sea. Would Vietnam be amenable to such a suggestion? First of all, I can say that the uh, nine dotted line is uh, groundless. And a a any country which has uh, a sea under the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is entitled to 100 nautical miles as exclusive economic zone. And the, you know that under the law, uh, international law, exclusive economic zone is not disputed area. So any uh, operations without the consent of the country which that exclusive economic zone belongs to is a violation of the international law. The same thing happened with the Auric China parked in the exclusive economic zone of Vietnam. There is, if a real disputed area should be a cooperation among the countries. But within the undisputed area, I mean the exclusive economic zone. So that is not a, disp a, di a disputed area. Uh, in the back. Uh... Thank you. Thanks, Ernie. Lisa Schroeder with the Dow Chemical Company. And Mr. Minister, thank you for your time today. And thank you for your government's efforts to streamline and strengthen the business climate in Vietnam. One particular area has been regulatory reform. The Vietnamese government has really been a leader in streamlining uh, the bureaucracy, removing outdated regulations, and making the regulatory process much more efficient. Uh, do you see opportunities where Vietnam could help lead efforts in ASEAN, especially as we move to AEC 2015, to promote that same type of more efficient, streamlined regulatory harmonization? Thank you. In ASEAN, we have to build three pillars in ASEAN, the political security pillar, the economic pillar, and social and cultural pillars. And of course, in the economic, to build the economic pillar of ASEAN, we have a kind of some measures which we have the same regulations in order to facilitate business community to do business in a favorable conditions in one country in ASEAN and at the same time in other countries like in Vietnam. To do that, we, Vietnam also, we had to have some reform in the uh, institutions in order to facilitate the business community. Thank you. One uh, final question, the gentleman here. Michael Yehuda from George Washington University. Um, I, as I, perhaps you can correct me, but my understanding is 
that uh, Vietnam disputes with China the whole of the Spratlys Islands. What is the basis on which Vietnam claims that? Let me phrase, rephrase that one. We have, we, uh, have the sovereignty over Paracel Islands and Spadley Islands. And Paracel Islands were taken away from us by China in 1956 and 1974. We continue to claim the sovereignty over that Paracel Islands. For Spadley Islands, there are five claimant states over the sovereignty of Spadley Islands. Seven, uh, five states and one territory. They are Vietnam, China, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Brunei. Mm -hmm. And one territory is as Taiwan, China. And with the Spratly Islands, we believe that we have to solve the dispute through peaceful means, multilaterally, meaning because we have not only between Vietnam, China, between Vietnam and the Philippines, but among the claimant states over Spratly Islands. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking the Prime Minister. <laughs> Deputy Prime Minister, sorry.